So let's go ahead and get started. All of the things on the slide will also be provided to you within our follow-up email. So don't feel like you need to write down everything right now. Uh, I would like to welcome you tonight to the Des Moines Metro Opera and Des Moines Public Library Book Club commemorating a brand new opera written by librettist Mark Campbell, as well as some other fine folks. And they have so graciously allowed us to partner with them to bring this book club to all of you. Uh, my name is Rebecca Cloud. I am a librarian here at Des Moines Public Library. Tonight, you will see myself as well as Jenny Golden and Elizabeth Hoover de Galvez, who are other librarians here. If you run into any issues throughout the evening, definitely let one of us know. If you need to step out or if you have a question, feel free to chat one of us and we will get you taken care of. So as I mentioned a few moments ago, if you're just now joining us tonight, uh, we are joined by Mark Campbell, who is a librettist and he wrote A Thousand Acres or the opera piece. And we'll talk more about what that means here in a moment. If you are an opera newbie, but a Jane Smiley lover, don't worry, you won't be left out. So we will spend about 30 minutes talking uh, to Mark about the opera and his amazing work. And then we will break out into rooms to have discussion, full on discussions and special feature. We have a pair of tickets that have been donated by the Des Moines Metro Opera to see the play or the opera later on this year. So without further ado, I would love to introduce Mark Campbell. Hello, hey. Mark. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Thank are you. Are you really out in a in a in a field right now? No, I no. attempted to find the best background that matched the book. Thematic. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Although I did see some hay bales this weekend. So oh, wow. I was out and about. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about you, Mark. First of all, for those opera newbies, would you mind telling us what a librettist is? Uh, how do you become one? What do you do? Sure. Um, a librettist is the person who provides the story and the text for an opera. A lot of people who are unfamiliar with opera think that librettists are people that come in and just sort of drop in words to Verdi's music. Um, it's kind of the opposite in the sense that the libretto is almost always written first. And um, a librettist often decides where the arias and where the ensembles, where the elevated moments of an opera will happen, because that's why we go to opera for those elevated moments. Um, and um, let's see, how did I become an opera librettist? I worked, I was an actor uh, many years ago. I was a really bad actor, so that didn't last long. Uh, and then someone asked me to write lyrics for musical theater. And I started doing that and really worked hard on that craft. Um, I am a big fan of Stephen Sondheim and have studied his work like my entire life. Um, and then in 2000, a composer named John Musso asked me to write my first opera. It was called Volpone based on the play by Ben Johnson. That was for Wolf Trap and I found home. Um, I just finished my 40th opera libretto, wow. and um, also I've written, let me see, I'm on my fourth oratorio, and I've written seven musicals and like close to a dozen song cycles. Um, I really love the form. I love the idea that you can take text and make it even more powerful and even more profound and even more, in a sense, community related um, through opera. Uh, and yeah, that's, I mean, um, that's how, that's how I became a librettist. I, I love, I love my job. I really love my job. So I have a question about how many operas do you write per year? And is it something where you find a subject that you want to write about or are you being commissioned? It's all across the boards. Um, I tend to write about two or three works a year. 
which which could be an oratorio, it could be an opera, it could be a small chamber opera, or something like that. Um, but you know, it's it was a, a difficult couple of, of of years, of course, because no one was commissioning works. We didn't even know if we were going to get be able to get back in a theater again. So it was a, a tricky couple of years. Um, and in terms of the ideas, they often come to me from outside places. In the case of A Thousand Acres, um, it came from Michael Eagle at Des Moines Metro Opera. Um, and also um, he approached the um, composer, Christian Custer, and um, somehow they, they decided to, to um, bring me into the project. I, I, don't know, I don't know what discussions happened you know, to make that happen, but, um, uh, and I read the book and I, I loved it. And I said, yes, there is something really, there is a true operatic story here. Um, a story that's ripe for operatic adaptation. Of course, it's also a story that that takes place in Iowa. Um, so it makes perfect sense that Des Moines Metro Opera would commission a work like that. So are you often working with operas across the country or do you have a home base that you like to work with? Well, I I live in New York. Um, I don't, most of my opera company, most of my operas tend to premiere with I hate to use the word regional opera companies because it sounds almost reductive. Um, but I have to say that I, and I've said this before, that I think the more exciting work is happening at opera companies like Des Moines Metro Opera or Minnesota Opera, where I've, I've written six operas for Minnesota Opera. Um, because I think these companies are the ones that are trying to find audiences for contemporary opera and finding ways to do it that through a way of looking at opera as a populist art form rather than um, an elitist art form. Uh, and I tend to think cities like New York and Los Angeles, and I'm a New Yorker, so I can, I can <laughs> say this and I'll, I'll add a curse word with it if you like, um, just to you know, give it the, the old New York sound. But um, I tend to think that those opera companies create works that are a little bit more elitist and um, great for audiences of, of, you know, 50 people in Brooklyn. Um, but I'm here to make operas that will fill theaters of 4,000 people. And my favorite audience, actually, um, is the one that consists of people who have not seen operas before, uh, that, who take a chance and go, well, this is kind of a cool story. Um, I'm not scared of it. I'm going to go see this opera and see what they do with the story. So that's my that's my favorite audience. I feel it is part of my responsibility at this point to be an ambassador for a new opera and to bring new audiences into the opera house. I love the idea of making opera accessible for people. Uh, of I mean, course, that's it, what libraries are all about, and I'm glad that Des Moines Metro Opera is bringing. I, I honestly cannot believe that we even have a discussion about that. Um, why would you create art? Why would you create performance art that is not accessible for an audience? Why would you want to alienate your audience? They're paying for the the experience. They could be staying home watching TV. Um, and, and they have to spend a lot of money to go to the opera often, or, and they have to hire a babysitter, or they have to do all these things. Like, that should just be a given. And it's interesting to me that often in opera that it's not, that people are suspicious of works that are directed at audiences. Interesting. So, kind of taking that approach, before we talk about this specific opera, I would love to know what are some general elements that you're looking for in an operatic story or things that you like to avoid when you're working. Um, the first thing I look for is, uh, is a character who the audience is going to care about. Care enough, care about enough to let them sing for two hours. Um, it's, it's opera for me goes right to the heart. And if, it, if there is no heart there, then there's really no opera. And there's no reason for the audience to, to watch it. Um, in, um, excuse me, A Thousand Acres, you have the character of Ginny Cook, who, it, who is the narrator and also the protagonist. Um, but Jane Smiley immediately makes us intrigued about who this character is right from the start. And um, 
I noticed, I mean, when I, when I read just the first chapters, I went, oh yeah, yeah, this is, this is great. This is operatic. Um, of course it's based on King Lear, but when you say it's based on King Lear, it's, it's like, I mean, she basically took a few elements of King Lear mm -hmm. and then said, but that's not the story. And I'm going to put it in Iowa and, um, put it in the seven 1970s. So I, I, I did not reread King Lear. <laughs> um, when I worked on this, because mm -hmm. I didn't find it useful. There's enough in Jane Smiley um, to adapt. I don't need to add Shakespeare to the mix. Um, mm -hmm. And I probably would have done something really pretentious with it if I had. So her story is strong enough. Um, the other thing that I always look for is there has to be sort of an, an element of otherness to a story that allows it to be operatic. Opera is the weirdest thing in the world. People don't go around <laughs> singing really loudly and with beautiful big notes. Um, so there has to be some kind of reason that, that is, it, it's an element that almost exists outside of the story that makes mm -hmm. us want to watch opera. Um, in the case of A Thousand Acres for me, it was watching Ginny's strength developing as a, as a human being. Um, that, that was something that, um, and also I suppose the beauty of the farm itself uh, even though Jane Smiley really, you know, the, the land is polluted, um, there are so many economic difficulties and everything like that, she still gives us little glimmers of hope and beauty throughout mm -hmm. that make us see the story more than a despairing story, a despairing and dark story. Okay, that leads perfectly into some of my next Good. questions. Um, I would really like to know was there one scene in the book while you were reading that you were like hold the phone i have to see this on stage as an opera and if so what was it oh that's a really good question um well i mean i don't have to worry about spoiler alert right because i'm assuming everyone's read it um if you've not finished close your ears for yeah. a moment i mean it would be the the scene that she left high um, where she's cooking and, 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 you know, and she says the desserts in the refrigerator, the beans are on the stove or whatever. Um, do you have to, do you, how much money do you have? And then leaves. I was like, oh, wow, I cannot wait to see that. And it's interesting. Um, Michael Eagle in Des Moines Metro Opera, um, gave us four workshops of this opera to make it better and make it better and make it better. And we could not get that scene right. Um, until the last workshop, the composer, Kristen Custer, and the stage director, Christine McIntyre, and Michael Eagle all kind of looked at each other and said, it needs these big moments of silence. Those will read even more strongly if we add those moments. And so now the scene, I think, is very powerful. One scene that I, I laughed at in the book that I knew that I was not going to put in the opera was the poison sausages. That was like, oh. that was just too much. And also... I laughed when I read it. I know the audience would laugh when they watched it. And it was like, I see how it works in the book, but it would never work on stage to me. Okay. There are probably librettists out there who would have started with that scene. Um, but they didn't get the chance I did. <laughs> I We were wondering, the other librarians here, and we were like, I wonder if it will take a Sweeney Todd moment when she's getting the sausages and the cabbage all canned up, but well, alas. Sweeney Todd, is, Sweeney Todd is my favorite opera. So, um, <laughs> wow, now you're, now you're making me maybe regret my choice. Uh, <laughs> um, no problem. I mean, there's always time. I don't think it's hit the stage yet. Maybe you could sneak now. one in. No. <laughs> <laughs> maybe the sequel. Yes. Yes. 2,000 acres or a thousand mm -hmm. acre and a half. I don't know. Yeah. Or bring it back down as they start losing the farm. Right, right, right. 500 <laughs> acres, which is terrible. But um, So you talk about the silence in that scene when Ginny is leaving. Did you have any challenges in adapting a novel that as quote unquote a professional reader, I find to be kind of quiet in nature? Yes. Um, well, you know, one of the one of the problems for me with this book 
and I shouldn't say the word problem, but one of the challenges um, is that the voice of, of Ginny, first of all, is extremely literate for a woman who I, I think she just graduated from high school. Um, she speaks extremely well with beautiful prose and everything like that. Of course, Ginny is a mixture of Jane Smiley and Ginny um, in the book. It's not purely Ginny's voice. So one of the things I had to do was to bring out Ginny's voice which is a little less well-spoken than Jane Smiley's voice. Um, um, it is a quiet book in many ways, but if you look at, I mean, I don't know, you can't look at the character of Larry and say it's a quiet character. Um, he may have secrets and buried some secrets, but when those erupt, they erupt as strongly as they do in, in King Lear. Um, and by the way, that was another scene that screamed out for opera. Um, and it ends scene one where he is in the storm and um, calls his daughters very bad names. And um, that was another scene that screamed out to me. So yes, it's a quiet, it, you know, I'll tell you, there's a scene in it. There's a scene with Jess um, and Ginny that Kristen Custer has set beautifully, and it's a scene where they, right before they fall in love, um, I, you know, I can't say fall in love because Jess does not fall in love with people, um, but Ginny falls in love with Jess, and Kristen has created this beautiful, quiet, um, they're descending notes as these characters start to connect with each other. Um, so there are moments of quiet and beauty in the opera as well as the very dramatic Shakespearean, if you will, moments of Larry screaming at his children in a storm. Mm -hmm. So another question that I had had kind of going back to this question about quietness, is kind of the innate musicality of the book. Um, were you finding it in characters or more of Jane Smiley's lyrical writings or the landscape? Where did that really kind of come in for you? Um, it can't, like, I'm someone who, well, this is, this will be a strange thing to say, I guess, but um, I really believe in the poetry of human speech um, and, and in simple human speech. Uh, I, there are librettists who believe in creating very elevated poetic works. To me, they fight with the music. I like the music to create the poetry in opera and the words to support that, but not to create it. Um, so I tend to write characters, I tend to write text that is simple um, and it's based on, on, on how a character speaks or how they react. Um, and sometimes I elevate that a little bit from the text, like the character of Jess um, in the book, he has one little monologue and I just expanded it a little bit more because I wanted Ginny to fall in love with him for the, the that little tiny bit of beauty inside his his soul um, that he misuses um, all the time. But there's but there's there is a beauty in his soul. Um, it's just it's funny because I have to distill work um, and bring it down to its basic most simplest level, and then in a certain way build it up a little bit but that has to happen in in a, a minimal way um because a good libretto allows for music that's why we're at the opera we're there for the music we're not we're there for the story and the music and the words can be beautiful and strong but they should never get in the way of the music Well, I have just two more questions for you before we start getting into some of our patron questions. And I'm kind of seeing them come a, across. Um, they're, they're really good. So we may have to go through all of them. Oh, good. Um, I'm excited. So, you know, you mentioned having to make some adaptations to the story about like the sausages, uh, leaving that out you know, were there things that you felt really comfortable changing or other scenes where you were like, I really don't feel comfortable changing it, but I feel that it needs to be in there. And how did you deal with that? Did you write Jane Smiley and be like, can I cut this out <laughs> or add, expand on this? Well, I have to say that um, 
I've been very, I've adapted several works um, in, into operas, uh, Stephen King's The Shining, um, Dinner at Eight, oh my God. I mean, Silent Night is an opera I wrote that's adapted from a screenplay. I mean, there's a long list of operas I've um, adapted and I ha I'm fortunate I have a really good record of um, that with the original authors of, 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 of works. So um, in the case of Jane Smiley, um, we did not ask her to give approval in the contract. Legally, um, you kind of usually do that, um, but I was thrilled when we didn't do that because I was nervous. I was really nervous about adapting this work. Um, but Michael Eagle very smartly said, but we need to, of course, involve her. Um, we need her around, and, and he's right. Um, she needs to be part of this community of a thousand acres because it was her story. Um, so I was really nervous when he sent it to her uh, because I made many decisions that were that were theatrical instead of, you know, that instead of um, written for novel, they had to be written for the stage. So I made made many many decisions um, that ch changed the book but did not alter the spirit of the book or the story. And um, I was so pleased when she approved it and seemed to be very happy with it. Um, uh, it means everything to me that the that I, I would want her to be really pleased, um, but I wouldn't want her to say in Act Three, Scene Two, you did not put in that line. Um, and I and then I'll have to explain. Yes, I didn't put in that line because it was it was like five hundred words long and it can't be sung. Um, fortunately, I didn't I didn't have to do any of that with her. Uh, and I feel like she's very much on board with this piece. I know she is actually. That's great. Yeah. Um, as she is a Des Moines Public Library favorite author. So I think hearing you talk about how much she is behind this project is really impactful. Um, yeah, I have some more fun questions before we get into patrons. Who is your favorite character and who's your least favorite? Well, my least favorite that's easy it's larry i mean that's like that's how could you like larry um when you ask who's my favorite character the real question on this is who do you see yourself as mm -hmm. in the book and interestingly none of the men um i probably see myself closer to rose than Ginny. um i like rose a great deal um but but of course i love Ginny. um yeah, I mean, it, I pretty much, you know, when you write a, when you write something like an opera libretto, you have to care about every single character. Like I even had to care about Larry. Um, you can't write a villain without understanding them on some level. Mm -hmm. uh, I would never be capable of committing any of the things that Larry has done, um, but I still have to understand it on some level. And that's a, that's a tricky thing. Um, but my favorite character would be, oh, let me take Ginny. Let, let me just say Sisterhood is my favorite character. Um, Ginny and Rose. I like that. I I think Rose is really interesting. So I'm going to be really excited to see what you do with her in, in the She's opera. She's really strong. And, and um, it's interesting that Ginny is in many ways passive. And it's strange to have a heroine who feels sort of passive through a great deal and, and by passive i mean she lets the th things happen to her without making them change and that's a strange thing in an opera because most opera is about like i'm going to change this right away and i'm going to move on i'm going to triumph over something mm -hmm. um but and rose is in some sense more of a operatic character but what we learn as we go on in this opera is that indeed Ginny is strong um yeah. She, she, she earns her strength. I think Rose is born with her strength, at least in the novel. And mm -hmm. I feel like Ginny earns her and therefore that makes for a more dramatic story. Kind of going off of that. So of course this is a novel. I believe that there may have been a film version at some point. Um, I didn't see it. I, I wouldn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> how does an opera versus these other types of medium like a tv mini series or a movie bring this book to life and bring it to life in a way that is impactful 30 years after publication well opera 
of course, is sung. And music is, um, at, for me, the reason I write opera is because I feel like music gets to those corners of our souls that words can't reach. Um, so when you combine the, the words and the music, um, opera just, it's an abstract art form. We can't analyze it. We can't, I mean, you, yes, you can analyze it as you could math in a way, but it gets to our soul. Um, yeah, I do this because I love music, not because I love words. Uh, I, yeah, and when someone's singing and when you have a cast as brilliant and terrific as we have for this production, then you add a layer of performance on it where you're seeing someone like Elise Qualiata singing um, Ginny and you're feeling for her as well as the character. Um, I, I, don't, I think that answers your question, right? Like, I think it does, yeah. And also, opera distills things into more direct emotion. I think if it's any good, it does that. Yeah. Whenever I've gone to an opera, I more come away with remembering the feeling yes. more than anything else. So that, I think, between that bridge answers the question. Mm -hmm. um, and we have some great patron questions, great. if you're ready. I'm ready. All right, our first one is from Jean, and her question is, who decides the voice types for each of the characters, the composer, the librettist, or both in collaboration? Well, that's a really great question. Um, it, it depends on the opera company. Um, a lot of times I'm left out of that discussion because I'm just writing the words, um, you know, and, but in the case of Des Moines Metro Opera, they're very, in, they like to involve um, as many creative people as possible. Uh, so Kristen, Christine, Michael Eagle, um, and I were sort of involved in that. I think I had the, I always take the the least important voice um, in that discussion because it's, it's more up to the composer. Um, but I'll tell you a story I think that's very interesting about this is that Larry, I originally thought Larry should be like a bass because in opera, it, the villain is usually a bass. And you think of King Lear as having a bass or a bass baritone voice. Um, but it was really Michael Eagle and I think Christine McIntyre who said, no, we, we should cast Roger Honeywell and he's a tenor. Um, and it was a brilliant idea because it's, it's, it, it kind of contradicts what usually happens in opera. And, uh, and also Roger Honeywell is a brilliant actor and has, uh, like a deep tenor, a very powerful tenor, not a light tenor. So um, yeah, the, the answer is the general director and artistic director of the opera company and the composer. Those are the two strongest voices in making the decision about voice types. Okay. Um, our next question is more so for you and your process. We've had a couple of patrons who are interested in your personal knowledge as a New Yorker of Iowa farming prior to your work on this, you know, how did you learn about Iowa and well, has I your view changed at all since this work? Yeah, I mean, like, I can't say that I lived in Iowa or anything like that. My experience with the farm goes back to my childhood. My grandfather, um, lived in a small town in Indiana called Washington, Indiana. And um, he was actually a baker on Main Street, um, but his brother had a farm. And so every summer we would go out there and um, stay on the farm, live on the farm, watch how the farm worked. Um, and I would say we did that for about eight to 10 years every summer. Um, I've never lived on a farm. I've never worked on a farm um, other than my childhood recollection of a farm, but I think in a certain way, I mean, there's a, there's an element of that in a thousand acres where there's a nostalgia for what the farm is or for what um, farmland or Iowa or the Midwest is. Um, I don't know if that is completely fulfilled, um, but uh, yeah, that's, that, that's, you know, that's my answer. Yes, I'm a New Yorker coming in and uh but fortunately jane smiley provided such a brilliant description that um that i didn't need to spend 20 years in iowa to know what her version of iowa is 
Excellent. Um, we have a question from Diane and she is wondering, were there any scenes that you thought of to thought of to play to lighten the mood? Or how do you balance all the emotion and turmoil throughout the story? Um, I love this is a great, great question because it's 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 very I'm right now writing an introduction to I'm creating a libretto booklet for this. And I'm writing an introduction to it. And I was just on the plane coming from New York here to Minneapolis. I was just writing about that particular subject. So it's fresh on my mind. Um, I, I'm known as um, writing a lot of comedy. Um, and so um, I look for things that are funny in a book. Um, and it's not because I need a joke or I need the audience to laugh. It's because I actually believe things can become sadder if they're funny first. I mean, look, look at, um, at um, Marriage of Figaro. Um, it, it's one of the reasons that opera has endured is because there's comedy and there's class struggle, but there's also terrific sadness. Um, and I think the sadness is deeper because of the lighter moments. So in terms of A Thousand Acres, well, Rose provides some good sarcastic lines. Um, she keeps us distant from all the heartache that's going on in a way. Um, you know, Jane Smiley had two Monopoly games played and, and, and I found that hilarious and wonderful and the audience will too, until we realize that the Monopoly game is where these siblings are gonna start tearing at each other. Um, mm -hmm. So it kind of makes the horror of that even deeper because it starts with something that seems sort of light and you don't guess that a monopoly game is going to go into a family fight. Um, let's see other light moments. I mean, I just, whenever Ginny has a sense of humor or Rose has a sense of humor about something, whenever they have sort of a wry voice, I try to bring it out. Um, it helps make a connection. Humor connects the audience in a way that pure tragedy and despair cannot. Mm -hmm. So. I, I try to bring that out as much as I can. That is such a good question. It makes me very happy that people are even looking for that. Yes. Um, there are so many dark things in the novel that there has to be some kind of levity. Exactly. Um, one question that came up for me and I saw a staff member asked is kind of taking that Monopoly game into the opera realm. Mm -hmm. And we're wondering kind of how how that comes about because at least in my family mop monopoly did often end up in yelling i usually just left because the game took too long for me but um well the monopoly game is fun for the audience but it was i had to go back <laughs> i had to go back i was writing this some friends had let me use their house on the north shore of long island to work on this libretto um because i have to go and weigh and write i can't do it in new york anymore i have to just wake i have to go to bed with the story wake up with the story drink with the story have dinner with the story you know it's like it has to really take over inside me and then it came to writing this monopoly scene i was just like oh my god i haven't made, played monopoly honestly in like 40 years and i i went and fortunately I had a monopoly game so i could measure out exactly like what is seven spaces you know and what is community chest and there's a there's a lot i forgot that in monopoly has a game about um has one of those card uh penalties where mm -hmm. uh it it says you and your you brought four tickets to the opera cough up fifty dollars or something <laughs> so that had to be in the libretto that had to be in the libretto it's not in the book but once i saw that there was a mention about opera yes um yeah it's it the, the Monopoly game, the first Monopoly game ends with a big question about a character. Um, actually, mm -hmm. it ends, since you know the story, it ends with Pete asking Rose why she won't allow Pete to babysit their children. Mm -hmm. And that should raise a question in the audience's mind, like, "What? wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, but then, of course, the second Monopoly game ends with complete um, chaos where everyone's just screaming at each other and Pete has a nervous breakdown and um, mm -hmm. and then of course Larry enters so that's that's the final scene of act one yeah 
Uh, so I see two more questions in the chat, if you're still doing good on time. Um, so Diane had a question. How do you balance the scenes of Rose in the hospital and dying? Um, well, first of all, this is, you're, this is, these are really good questions. There has not been a, a dumb one yet. And I'm, I'm, I'm used to like um, people saying, what is an opera? Um, so, and I also love that these are very specific to the adaptation of this story. So I'm very grateful to all of you for asking these questions. Um, I decided early on that I was going to set the opera only in the two houses of um, Larry's and um, Ginny's. Um, and it's mostly in and around Ginny's house. Uh, we sense that there's a farm out there. It's not, there are no fields of grain. I mean, it's, it's, the stage doesn't allow that. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to really just set it in those two places. They never go to Mason City. They don't, you know, none of that. Um, so there are no scenes of Rose in the hospital. And we hear of Ginny taking Rose into the doctor to see how, um, what's going on with the cancer. And they come back saying that there's not a trace, not a trace. I wanted to celebrate that moment early on in the book where Rose and Ginny are like, you're gonna live, you're gonna be fine. But Rose still says, I want you to take care of my daughters in case something mm -hmm. happens to me. We never, act two has the scene, um, Pete, um, the Pete suicide scene, we, we learn from, from through Rose. We don't see Pete in a truck driving into a quarry. Um, we don't have the budget for that. Uh, but we do learn about what its effects are on Rose and her children. Um, and um, we also see Rose have later a breakdown in act two. Um, but the opera towards the end, after um, Ginny decides to leave, we make a huge leap forward until the last day when she comes back to to divide um, to divide all the stuff in the house mm -hmm. with um, Caroline. And in fact, the opera starts with that scene and ends with that scene. Oh. Uh, it bookends the opera. And the reason I did that is because I wanted the audience at the beginning of the opera to know that Ginny may have a way out of this mm -hmm. story. We don't know that in the book, but we but in the book we have her voice. Mm -hmm. and we sense her strength in the in the opera i wanted the audience to know that there's hope in this story um and so i don't we, do, we don't see rose in the hospital and and the opera is is also much more ginny centric than rose centric okay yeah i i imagine that would be hard on stage with all the sets and that sort of thing yeah, you just don't want that. And this, the main part of the story is concentrated on these two homes. Like, I don't, you know, I don't need to see other scenes. The, the heart of the story is is right there. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we have uh, two questions that I'm going to combine into one. Okay. So you mentioned that you've written both operas and musicals. Are there anything in the stories that you look for to decide before I'm going to do this as a musical, I'm going to do that one as an opera. Do you think that A Thousand Acres could have been more of a musical, no. a la Hamilton? No. Always well, an I opera. I wouldn't say, I, I've never, I didn't write Hamilton. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I wish I had, but um, um, so I can't say, I can't answer that. I think Lin-Manuel would, would be able to answer that question. Um, uh, for me, it's, it's an operatic story. It requires the larger feeling of an opera and the more expansive sound of an opera than a musical. Um, I, I don't know. I just, I can't imagine Ginny singing a show tune after all she's gone through. It requires the, the depth and the complexity of operatic music. I also think it requires an operatic singer rather than a musical theater singer or a rapper or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. No, it's, it's, it's only an opera. Uh, if it's going on stage, it's only an opera for me. Mm -hmm. um, do you think other types of performance art 
you know, for ballet, for example, uh, I know that's not particularly your realm of expertise, but as someone in the performing arts, could you theoretically see where someone could turn this into a ballet or an interpretive dance? <laughs> interpretive dance, I mean, I just, when I hear that, I start laughing, but um, oh. sorry, because uh, I think like a, you know, a unitard and crazy things. Um, Yes, it could be turned into a story ballet. I'm not a fan of story ballets. I prefer abstract ballets. Um, I, I, that's just a personal taste. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think it could possibly be a ballet. Okay. You know, but it would require someone like Agnes DeMille. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if those people exist anymore. Yeah. Um, and also you'd really have to you'd really have to edit the story mm -hmm. um, because there are just too many, uh, there would be too many characters and too many plots that would have to be expressed in dance. I think mm -hmm. that would be hard. Yeah. Well, we have a question from Brianne. Uh, how do you carefully read or make notes when you know you'll be adapting a work? You know, for example, I have my copy of the book here, which has all these different colored notes. Um, to prepare for the book club. I imagine what you do is much more intensive. Oh, so gosh. I need some tips. Okay. Um, I will, when I'm first reading a book, I'll just do the really, you know, um, gosh, basic thing of using a yellow highlighter and, and read a pro, you know, prose. Usually it's something that just sings to me. There's something in it that's, that feels like song. Um, but what, the way I adapt is that I read the book, I read it, I read it, I read it, I start creating an outline, and then I put it aside. Because the libretto has to exist on its own. It can't be, I'm not just taking the book and putting it on stage. The libretto is its own creature, and it has to exist as, as its own creature. And so there's a certain point where you just forget the book, and the libretto comes to life as its, as its own organism. Um, I have no, I, I do, I will say this, if I'm writing it and I suddenly get stuck, then I'll go back to the book. And that's where I'll find the wisdom of Jane Smiley that will lead me into something better than I was, I was going down the wrong road. And then, but I have enough knowledge to go, maybe Jane Smiley will help me with this and I'll go back and read something in the book and then that will straighten it out. Um, yeah, I, I, it's very important that you, you, you have to be, you have to be slavish to the spirit of the book, but you cannot be slavish to the book itself, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, I feel that I have really created, I'm sorry, Kristen Custer and I have really created what the book means and what the book feels, but we did not follow every single line and every pot line. We did not have poisoned sausages in, in, you know, in the opera. Um, it's interesting with The Shining, when I did the adaptation of The Shining, so many people think, oh, I can't wait to see the, um, the um, all work and no play makes Jack a doll boy scene. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, this is an adaptation of the novel. It's not an adaptation of the, of the movie. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't exist in, exist in the book. So it, it could not find its way into the opera. So I came up with another solution that was even scarier. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I'm not going to tell you what it is because I want The Shining to go to Des Moines Metro Opera. Um, uh, but yeah, you when you adapt, you your job is to distill, to preserve, to care deeply about what the original author has said, but to not duplicate it. Yeah, I think that's really important and a a mark of a good adaptation. I mean, no one wants to see exactly what they read in the book, despite how much they say they do. Well, and also if they did, they would be sitting through an eight hour opera. Yes. Um, and no one <laughs> wants to do that. I don't care. No one wants to do that. And this opera <laughs> is two hours. Um, okay. Two hours and some change, I think. Oh, perfect. That's the right amount of time, I think. Me too. Shorter is always better. <laughs> yeah. We can go to dinner sooner. I, I don't know. 
Yes. Well, Mark, I really want to thank you for your time and your answers and your openness to talking with us tonight. I've seen in the chat a lot of praise from hearing from you. Uh, people are very interested in what you have to say, as well as a lot of great praise for the Des Moines Metro Opera as well. May I ask something? Yeah. Can I ask something to that? You guys have this brilliant cultural institution in Iowa, Des Moines mm -hmm. Metro Opera, and it is achieving a global reputation. Like, like one reason I accepted this gig is because I wanted to work in Des Moines. I wanted to work for this company because um, wow. it sure wasn't the money. Um, no, I'm kidding. Money was fine. <laughs> but, but you have an incredible organization, and I hope you will support it because it's a true gem. Um, and it is creating new opera and making us look at opera in new ways. So I just urge everyone on this call to support the opera and tell your friends to support it. It's a great company. I feel really privileged working with them. Yes. Um, I am really excited to see it even more so after talking to you than I was before. Oh, good. Uh, well, then my, my work is done here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, sure. We truly, truly appreciate it. And, you know, for those of you who are going to be ready to get into the discussion here momentarily, first, we are going to have a prize drawing for the pair of tickets donated to us by the Des Moines Metro Opera for people on this call tonight. And so you can go see it. But if you don't win the tickets, don't worry. We have information about where you can purchase tickets and see the previews both at Central and at Franklin this summer. All right. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm going to head out. Okay. Yeah. See you. See you in July. Yes. Okay. Bye-bye.